All right, hi everyone. I hope you guys are having a great day. So today's lecture video is gonna focus on the theories of Skinner. So we're gonna be talking about behaviorism today, which will include information about, in particular, operant and classical conditioning. So for some of you, this may be a review. You may have heard this before in other classes. For some of you, this may be new. Please feel free to let me know if you have any questions about the information from today's lecture. So after today's lecture, we will then have a lecture on Bandora, and then we'll finish up the semester talking about assessment and therapy in light of all the things that we've talked about throughout the semester. At that point, we will then have exam four, which is going to be the required proctored exam. So as soon as possible, sometime this week, I'm going to set up Smarter Proctoring, where you can go in and set up an appointment to take that proctored exam. So I'll be sending out an email with more information on that soon. Also, you will have an activity this week, so make sure that you complete that. Let me know if you need anything. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and get into lecture for today. All right, so as I said, today we're going to be talking about the theories of Skinner. Now, Skinner is going to be different from pretty much all of the theorists that we've talked about this semester in that he wouldn't necessarily have considered himself a personality theorist. When we think about personality, we think about someone's inner workings, we think about someone's emotions, someone's way of thinking, and that's certainly not going to be what Skinner is going to emphasize. Skinner is going to focus primarily on behavior. So just as a brief overview here, we're going to see that the behaviorism that we're going to be talking about today really emerged from laboratory studies of especially animals, but also humans as well. This might be what comes to mind when we think about behaviorism. We think about mice in a maze being reinforced and rewarded for different things. So the basic idea behind behaviorism is that animals and humans are essentially machines that can be trained. And so we're going to focus primarily from a behavioral point of view on observable behavior, not on speculation. So throughout the semester, you might have heard the ideas of unconscious conflicts and um, an ideal self that is different from the actual self or we might have talked about an individual having something blocking them from reaching self-actualization. Um, all of those things are things that are speculated about but are not easily observable. On the other hand, Skinner is going to say that n those things may exist but they may not. We don't know for sure. We're going to focus on what we can observe. So he's going to avoid anything hypothetical if at all possible He's essentially going to say that behavior is lawfully determined, which means that nothing happens at random. There is a scientific reason for all behavior, and we're going to be talking about that today. We're going to be talking about the fact that, as Skinner suggested, behavior is definitely influenced by our environment. But Skinner would go so far as to suggest that we really don't have any free will at all. Basically, everything that we do is determined by our environment. So briefly looking at a biography of Skinner, Skinner was born in Pennsylvania in 1904. As a child, one of his favorite things to do was to write, and he wanted to be a writer when he grew up, but as he got older, he had some difficulties with that and ended up instead turning to a career in psychology, although later in his life he did go on to write a novel that was well received. But he earned his PhD in psychology at Harvard, and he was very much influenced, as you might imagine, by other behaviorists at the time. We're going to talk about a couple on the next slide. But as we see here, Skinner is really going to focus on the behavior, and he's going to see that humans and animals can be trained. One of the things it mentions here is that he trained pigeons to guide bombs. Um, basically, with the right amount of reinforcement and punishment, according to Skinner, you can train anyone to do anything. So we'll be touching on those terms today. Now, a couple of people that were definitely influential on Skinner Thorndike was a very early behaviorist who suggested this law of effect, basically the idea that when we do something and it works well for us and we're satisfied with the outcome, we're more likely to do it again in the future. This is going to sound very similar to Skinner's concept of reinforcement that we're going to talk about later. Um, Watson is another relatively well-known behaviorist. You may have heard of Watson before. If you've heard the story of little Albert, then that's connected with Watson. Um, basically, the brief version of that being that he trained a little boy to have a phobia of white rabbits, and then the little boy's mother was very disturbed by that and ended up taking him out of the study before they could undo that conditioning. So from um, anecdotal reports, little Albert didn't have a very pleasant life after that as well. So anyway, regardless, 
John Watson was a very radical behaviorist who suggested that all those things that we think about when we think about psychology today, we think about emotion and thinking and introspection and consciousness, all of those things really should play no role in the scientific study of behavior. Those are not scientific things. And Watson might have even gone so far as to say those things did not exist. The best thing to do is to try to predict and control behavior through the principles of conditioning, which we're going to be covering today. Now, Skinner was probably not as far into radical behaviorism as Watson. Skinner is going to suggest that, yes, those things do exist. You do have emotions, you do have thoughts, you do have feelings, but those things are not something that we can study scientifically, and instead we're going to focus on the things that can be studied scientifically. But Thorndike and Watson are a couple of the people who influenced Skinner. So Skinner was a big believer in scientific behaviorism, allowing for prediction and control of behavior, but not an explanation of its causes. Basically the idea that every behavior that we do, we do for a reason, and if we pay attention, we can then figure that out, make predictions about future behavior, we can change reinforcement and punishment to change behavior, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can explain all of the causes behind behavior, nor should we try to. Skinner would suggest that we don't know why people do what they do necessarily. It doesn't really matter why they're doing it. It matters what they're doing. And so then, a very strict behaviorist would say, you are what you do. Now, we talked earlier about psychoanalysis, which is all about having those unconscious conflicts within yourself. Um, obviously, this is pretty much the antithesis here. When we're talking about behaviorism, and it's all about what you do, it's not about your internal conflicts. And this is also going to stand in contrast with humanism that we talked about earlier in the semester. The idea that basically humanism suggests that we are the center of our own experience and that our own way of viewing the world is one of the most important things to us. Here we're talking strictly about behavior. This is a very, very logical way of looking at things. So. Today we're going to have a lot of technical information. We're basically going to have a behavior modification 101 here. So I'm going to go through and give examples and I'm going to cover all of these concepts as best I can. But I also want you to know that you can come by or shoot me an email if you have questions about any of this material. So basically we're going to talk about two types of conditioning today. We're going to start off talking about classical conditioning, which is also called respondent conditioning. And then we'll spend the majority of today's class time talking about operant conditioning. So classical conditioning, first of all, is not a new concept when Skinner discussed it. Um, Pavlov was probably the person that we think of most when we think about classical conditioning. It's the idea that we learn association between things when things go together. So basically, this is a description of Pavlov's study to try to give you an idea of what these terms mean. So what Pavlov found, he had dogs that he was doing research with. And what he found was that when he would come and give them food, they would salivate a good bit. Now, that's a very normal reaction. When I say salivate, I mean drool, right? The dogs would drool. Um, and so the unconditioned stimulus led to the unconditioned response. The unconditioned stimulus of the food led to an unconditioned response of the dog salivating with no learning needed. You note that the unconditioned part means that it's natural. We didn't teach it to them. So they have this unconditioned stimulus of the food that is naturally something that they're going to respond to. The response is natural here, and we haven't actually taught the dogs anything. Take any dog anywhere in the world and give them food, and they're going to salivate. But what happens if we were to take something neutral, like, let's say, a bell? What happens if we ring a bell? Is that going to make a dog salivate? No, there's no reason for a dog to salivate when he hears a bell ringing, unless we train him to do so. So originally the bell is neutral. You ring a bell, the dog does not drool when you ring the bell. That's what we expected. But what happens if every time you give the food, you ring a bell first? Ring the bell, give the food. Ring the bell, give the food. Ring the bell, give the food. What happens is that over time, the dog learns an association between the bell and the food. The bell that was originally neutral has now become a conditioned stimulus, which means it is now capable, excuse me, it's now capable of producing a conditioned response. So, the unconditioned stimulus of the food naturally causes the unconditioned response of the dog salivating. Now I'm going to teach the dog that the bell means the food is coming. When you do that over and over again, the dog learns that association and before long, the dog will salivate when he hears the bell. 
regardless of whether or not the food is presented, okay? He's learned an association. It has now become a conditioned stimulus that causes a conditioned response. Now, one thing you'll notice here is that the conditioned response and the unconditioned response are the same response, salivating. And for the purposes of this class, they will be the same. The difference is that the conditioned stimulus um, the conditioned stimulus produces the conditioned response only after conditioning, not beforehand, right? So the unconditioned response happens naturally in response to the unconditioned stimulus. The conditioned response happens only after conditioning, after we've taught the dog the association between the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus, okay? Let me give you another example here. Um, imagine that you are in a healthy, happy relationship, which I hope if any of you are in relationships that they are healthy, happy relationships. So when you're in a healthy, happy relationship, your partner, being with your partner, is an unconditioned stimulus that naturally causes the unconditioned response of feeling happy, right? Nobody had to teach you to feel happy when you're around your partner. It's just something that happens naturally, assuming that it's a happy relationship. But what happens if, over time, your partner starts wearing a certain perfume or cologne? Initially, that perfume or cologne was neutral. If you picked it up at Walmart and smelled it, you might say, oh, that's nice, or, or whatever, but it wouldn't cause any real reaction in you. But what happens if you smell the smell, you see your partner? Smell the smell, you see your partner. Your partner starts wearing the smell all the time, you become conditioned to it. Now, this previously neutral smell has become a conditioned stimulus that can cause a conditioned response of making you feel happy. Notice that the unconditioned response and the conditioned response are the same response. It's just that we had to learn the conditioned response because it's a response to the smell. We did not have to learn the unconditioned response because it's a response to being with our partners, right? We have probably all experienced this at some point. Maybe there's a certain smell that makes us think about our childhood or a certain smell that makes us think about what our grandparents' house smelled like, that kind of thing. Um, we learn these associations very quickly. So that's the big picture idea of classical conditioning. Auburn conditioning is a very simple concept, and as long as you understand the terms, you'll have no trouble with it. If you do have any confusion, though, about it, please let me know. The basic idea behind operant conditioning is that when you do something and it works out well for you, you're more likely to do it again. If you do something and it does not work out well for you, you're less likely to do it again. So let's say that you walked up to a very attractive person and asked the individual out on a date, and they said yes. You've been reinforced for that. Now you're more likely to ask someone out on a date again in the future. On the other hand, if you walk up to someone and ask them out and they slap you in the face, you've been punished and you are less likely to go ask an individual out again. Okay, big picture idea here. When things work out well for you, you're more likely to do them again. Not guaranteed, but you're more likely. And when things don't work out well for you, you're less likely to do them again. Even though you might still do them again, they're not as likely. So. When we talk about reinforcement, we're talking about doing something that increases a behavior. When we talk about punishment, we're talking about something that decreases a behavior. Now, you'll notice, though, that we have two different types of reinforcement and two types of punishment. We have positive and negative. Now, what I'm asking you guys to do here so that you can understand this concept is to try to think about, when we're talking about this, math. Okay. Think about positive as adding something, addition, and negative as taking something away, subtracting something. I do not mean positive and negative as in good or bad in this sense. Okay. I just mean that with positive, we're adding something. So think about a plus sign. Negative, we're taking something away. We're subtracting something. Okay. So let me give you some concrete examples here. So positive reinforcement. It's reinforcement, so we're trying to increase a behavior. It's positive, so we're increasing a behavior by adding something. So let me give you an example. Um, if my son does something that I ask him to do, I want to give him a reinforcement for that. A positive reinforcement means I give him something good. I could give him praise. I could give him a piece of candy. I could let him watch a little extra TV time, that kind of thing. If I want to reinforce my college students for coming to class, I could give them extra credit points, right? Um, if you want to reinforce your roommate for doing their dishes, then you could take them out to dinner or something like that, okay? Giving money, giving praise, giving extra credit points, those are positive reinforcers. We're adding something good to increase a behavior, okay? Now, negative reinforcement is still reinforcement, which means we're still trying to increase the behavior. But because it's negative, it means we're taking something away. So what I want you to do here is not to picture something negative as in something bad, the negative is like a negative sign. We're subtracting, we're taking something away here. 
So how could I increase the behavior by taking something away? Well, I can do that by taking away something that you don't want. Let me give you an example. In many of the classes that I teach, I set it up where you get a drop grade for exams. The idea here is that if you work hard on the first four exams, you don't have to take the final exam. Did I give you anything? No, I didn't give you anything good. Instead, I took away something you don't want. That's negative reinforcement, okay? You are negatively reinforced when you're able to avoid something you don't like, okay? Let me give you another example. What happens if my kids do well in their lessons and I say, okay, well, because you did so well in your lessons, you don't have to eat your broccoli tonight. Is that reinforcing? Does that mean it's more likely for them to work hard on their lessons? Yes. But is it because I gave them something good? No, it's because I took away something they did not want. Another example, imagine that you have a really bad headache and you take some Tylenol and the Tylenol takes your headache away. That makes you more likely to take the Tylenol again in the future. That means it's a reinforcement because it's increasing the likelihood of a behavior. But it's a negative reinforcement. That Tylenol did not give you something good. It took away something that you did not want. Okay? So let me know if you have any questions about that. Now, when we're talking about punishment, we're talking about trying to decrease a behavior. So positive punishment, once again, the positive here does not mean good. It does not mean we like it. Positive means plus. We're adding something. So with positive punishment, it could be that we add pain, for example. So corporal punishment, physical punishment would be an example there. Or you could add extra work, extra chores. Go outside and cut the grass with a pair of scissors, clean the bathroom floor with your toothbrush kind of thing. Okay, um, stereotypes from movies, I'm sure. But positive punishments where we are adding something that you don't want. Negative punishment, it's punishment, so I'm trying to decrease a behavior, but it's negative, so I'm trying to decrease it by taking something away. So like a parent that tries to decrease their kids' um, talking back behaviors by putting them in timeout or taking away their cell phone or taking away their privileges. Um, basically, prison is one big timeout. Um, having everything taken away from you, negative punishment. If you get pulled over and you have to pay a speeding ticket, a speeding ticket is negative punishment because they're taking your money away from you. Anything that takes your money is negative. Negative punishment, okay? So let me know if you have any questions about that. That's the basic big picture idea of operant conditioning. Now, when we talk about operant conditioning, we talk about reinforcement a lot more than we talk about punishment. And that's for a reason. There are problems with using punishment. I mean, punishment needs to be used when needed. The problem is that punishment doesn't teach any new behaviors. It teaches an individual what not to do, but it doesn't teach them what to do. And so for a lot of reasons that are a little bit beyond the scope of this class, we would really prefer to use reinforcers whenever possible. So when we're thinking about types of reinforcers, there's something else we need to understand here. The difference between an unconditioned and a conditioned reinforcer. So we're talking about operant conditioning here. We're talking about giving a reward, essentially, or trying to increase the likelihood that a behavior will happen again. A primary or unconditioned reinforcer is a reinforcer that is naturally reinforcing. No one had to teach you to like it. So babies like food. Nobody teaches a baby to like food. They especially like sweet food, as you find out. As soon as they figure out that there are sweet tasting things in the world, all of a sudden they don't want the green beans anymore. It doesn't take them long to learn that. So we are born with a predisposition to like things that taste good. Or we like sleep. Sleep is another unconditioned reinforcer. Um, sex, novelty, like new exciting things, or comfort, feeling good, all of these things are unconditioned. They're natural, okay? On the other hand, there are some things that are conditioned reinforcers. Basically what that means is they're not reinforcing the first time you get them, but they become reinforcing when you learn that you can exchange them for things that you like. So a, an example that comes to mind here sometimes is the token economy. A token economy is basically the idea that you earn a certain number of tokens, whether those be points or poker chips or stickers on a sticker chart, and when you get enough, you can exchange them for something good. It's not so much that the sticker on the sticker chart itself is really reinforcing. It's just a sticker. But it's the idea that you know that you can save up your stickers and trade those in to get something that you want. That's a conditioned reinforcer. It's not naturally reinforcing, but we learn to like it because we learn that it's associated with all those things that we can turn them in to get. 
So we have two different types of condition reinforcers, simple condition reinforcers and generalized condition reinforcers. A simple condition reinforcer means that the points or the tokens or whatever that you've saved up, you can only exchange to get one thing. This would be like a teacher telling their students, for every 10 stickers you get, you get another 10 minutes of recess. So 10 minutes of recess is valuable to a lot of kids, but that's the only thing you can get with it is recess minutes. You can't do anything else with them. So a simple condition reinforcer is something that can only be exchanged for one thing. Like maybe if you had a bus token, well, if you need to get somewhere, a bus token is very reinforcing, but you can't use your bus token anywhere else, okay? On the other hand, a generalized condition reinforcer is a condition reinforcer, just like we've been saying, you learn to like it, you can accumulate it and trade it for other things, but a generalized condition reinforcer means you can trade it for lots of different things, whereas a simple condition reinforcer can only be exchanged for one thing. This would be like the teacher saying, you can turn in your tickets for extra recess minutes or a homework pass or ice cream or a toy out of the toy box. So if you can trade them in for several different things, that's usually more effective. If at all possible, we want to do generalized condition reinforcers because people tend to like that better. One other quick note here is that money is the ultimate generalized condition reinforcer. Money is a condition reinforcer because when you give a $100 bill to a two-year-old, they don't know what to do with it. They're going to chew on it, which they really shouldn't chew on it, um, color on it, tear it to pieces. They don't know what it is. But over time, you learn the value of money. But why is money valuable? Money is only valuable because of the things that you can buy with it. If you found yourself on a desert island with a million dollars and no place to spend it, it wouldn't do you a whole lot of good, except maybe to, you know, use for burning a fire, potentially. Wouldn't do you a whole lot of good. But it's a generalized condition reinforcer because with money, you can buy lots of different things. And that is why money is so reinforcing. All right, so another concept to keep in mind, this is a very straightforward concept, shaping. Shaping is the idea that sometimes we want to reinforce ourselves for something that we cannot immediately go out and do right now. So we need to come up with a plan of small steps that reinforce each step getting us closer and closer to our goal. So let's say, for example, that I wanted to run a marathon. Um, I don't do a whole lot of exercise, if I'm being honest with you guys. Not a lot of formal exercise. I haven't seen the inside of a gym in about eight years or more. But the idea is that if I wanted to get up and run a marathon right now and I said, well, I'm going to give myself a reinforcer for running a marathon, that reinforcer would not do me any good. I am not physically capable of going right now and running a marathon. But what if I said, okay, I'm going to give myself a small reinforcer for jogging a half a mile. And I continue to do that until jogging a half a mile is pretty easy for me. And then I say, okay, well now I'm going to give myself a reinforcer for jogging a mile. I'm not going to get the reinforcer anymore for doing half a mile. Now I have to do a whole mile. And then I have to do two miles. And then I have to do three miles. And so on and so forth. That's basically what this means. It says reinforcement of successive approximations. All we mean by successive approximation is little baby steps that are closer and closer to our final goal. So that eventually we'll be able to reach our final goal behavior of running a marathon. And you can do this with any number of other things as well. But if you said, I'm not going to get the reward until I finish the behavior, you're likely to give up and quit long before you get there. That would be just like telling yourself, I'm going to reward myself when I graduate from college on the first day of freshman year. You've got a lot of work to do between now and then. Better to set up small rewards throughout the way instead of trying to not reward yourself until you make it all the way to the end. The same thing could be done for bad behaviors. Maybe if we have an individual who does a certain behavior, they want to decrease, right? Sometimes we think about this as someone maybe who's um, using substances. So maybe we want to cut down on the amount of alcohol we're drinking. So maybe we say, well, I don't feel like I can go cold turkey all of a sudden. So, so for a week, we take one less drink a day and we reinforce ourselves for that. And then the next week it's two, and then so on and so forth, where we actually start gradually decreasing the amount of alcohol we're consuming until we get closer and closer to our goal of not drinking at all, right? Okay, so one other thing to be thinking about here when we're talking about operant conditioning would be schedules of reinforcement. This is just the idea of when am I going to give my reinforcer? So when I want to give someone a reinforcement for a good behavior, should I give them the reinforcer every time they do a good behavior? Or should I only give it to them some of the time? And if I only give it to them some of the time, how often should I give it? Some of the practical things that you have to think about when you're going to start reinforcing. 
Well, if you give a reinforcer every single time, that's called continuous reinforcement. For example, if I wanted to, I could give my son a reinforcement every single time he did a math problem. That would be continuous reinforcement. I might do that at the beginning. You might decide to use continuous reinforcement at the very beginning because someone might not know how to do the behavior or they might not um, really want to do the behavior and if you give them a reward every time it can help them get started. But once they're doing the behavior pretty frequently you want to try to switch to one of these schedules of reinforcement. There are lots of reasons why you don't want to continue to give the reinforcer every single time. Um, but basically, the real world doesn't really function that way. You guys probably know this. You don't get rewarded every single time you go to class or every single time you go to work. You get rewarded for doing it enough over a long period of time. But also because we don't want the individual to satiate on the reward. What I mean by that is sometimes a child will get bored with the reward. Or adults do this as well. Maybe the adult or the child gets bored and they don't really care about the reward and they're not really working for that reward anymore. We don't want that to happen. So, if we're going to try to give a reinforcement schedule that is intermittent, in other words, not every time they do the behavior, we might use one of these schedules of reinforcement. Now, you're going to see these terms ratio and interval here. Fixed ratio, or well, when we talk about ratio, first of all, we're talking about the individual's behavior. So, fixed ratio means that you're going to get a reinforcement after a fixed or set number of behaviors and this person knows how many times they have to do the behavior to get the reward. So, for example, let's say that I told my son every four math problems you do, you'll get a piece of candy. Now, that is not continuous reinforcement because he's not getting a piece of candy for every one he does. It's fixed ratio. It's fixed because he knows how many he has to do and it's the same number every time and it's ratio because it's based on his behavior. Now, if I tell my son that he has to do four math problems to get a piece of candy. It's really up to him how long it takes him to do that. He could sit there all day long and it could take him a whole day to do four math problems or depending on how difficult it is he could do them all in two minutes. So this is really under his control. Maybe you guys played high school sports. Maybe you had a coach that said okay you can run three laps and then you can take a water break. Well that's a fixed ratio. You know how many laps you have to run before you're going to get the water break and it's really pretty much within your control how long it takes you to do that. On the other hand, a variable ratio schedule is one in which it's still based on your behavior but you don't know how many times you're going to have to do the behavior before you get the reward. So, for example, let's say that someone goes to a casino and they're playing a slot machine you don't know how many times you're going to have to put a coin in the machine before you win some money. It could be that you put coins in the machine all day long and you never win any money or it could be that you put one more coin in and you win a million dollars. Variable ratio is considered very addictive. It's one of those things where you don't know it could be the next time, right? It could be the next time we do this. I was telling this to my husband the other day um, since I've been married. My husband and his mom both love to go thrift store shopping and garage sailing and I have to admit that I'm, I'm kind of getting used to it. It's kind of growing on me as well but I was telling my husband that thrift store shopping and, and garage sailing those are really variable ratio schedules. Maybe I go to one more garage sale and I find exactly what I'm looking for, right? Maybe I go to one more thrift store and I get a great deal on something, right? The idea here is that if the individual doesn't know how many more times they're going to have to do the behavior to get the reward, they will be constantly on the edge of their seat thinking it might be the next time I might get the reward the next time. Okay, So ratio schedules are based on your behavior. Interval schedules are based on time. So a fixed interval means that the first time you do a behavior after a certain amount of time passes, you get the reward or the reinforcer. Okay. So let me give you some examples of this. Let's say that you're in a college class and the professor says that your final grade is going to be posted at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? That is a fixed interval schedule. You know how much time you have to wait before you're able to check your grade and get the reinforcer, assuming that seeing your grade is reinforcing for you. Okay? Now, it does not matter how many times you do the behavior. 
there's like clicking and checking your grade throughout the day will not speed up the professor posting the grades. I remember being in college and I know it feels that way, right? Like you're wondering about this grade and you're checking and checking and checking. But fixed interval means you know how long you have to wait. Now the important thing is you do still have to do the behavior. If you wait until 3 o'clock and you don't check your grade, you're not going to get the reinforcer. But it's the first time you do the behavior after a set amount of time. Another example here might be if there's a certain television show that you enjoy watching and you know what day of the week and what time it comes on. So it doesn't matter how many times you turn on your television throughout the day. It's not going to make it more likely for your show to come on. You still have to wait a fixed amount of time until your show comes on. But also, you still have to do the behavior. You have to turn the television on when it gets to 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock. Otherwise, you won't get to watch your show. So after a fixed amount of time arrives or passes, then you're able to get reinforced the first time you do the behavior. Okay? Variable interval is the idea that you're going to get rewarded the first time you do a behavior after amount of time passes, but you don't know how much time has to pass before you're going to get the reward. What comes to mind here is fishing. I don't know if you guys fish. I'm just a little bit too ADHD and impatient to fish. But um, if you go out fishing, I'm told um, by my uh, husband's stepfather, who is uh, an excellent fisher, told you're supposed to cast a line out and leave it there, and you're not supposed to mess with it. That's just really hard for me to do. But uh, the idea is, with the variable interval, you don't know how long you're going to have to wait until you get a bite. It could be that you cast your line and you wait two seconds and a fish bites your hook. It could be that you cast your line and you wait hours and hours and you don't know when your hook is going to get a bite, if it does at all. That's variable interval. You don't know how long you're going to have to wait. Okay. So if you have any questions about those, let me know. Now, extinction is just the idea that conditioning is not perfect and it's not, it's not permanent. It can be undone. So we can have extinction of classical conditioning and operant conditioning. And extinction is just the idea that our conditioning can become undone. So like, for example, if we're talking about operant conditioning, if you stop reinforcing good behavior, eventually the behavior will stop. Like, for example, if I had been giving my kids candy for doing their lessons or doing their chores and I stopped giving them candy, they may keep doing the behavior for a while, hoping the candy will come back. But eventually they're going to stop doing it. Also, when we're talking about operant conditioning, it's the same thing for punishment. If you have been punishing a bad behavior and then you stop punishing the bad behavior, the bad behavior will come back. Okay, So you have to continue to be consistent. Now, operant conditioning is susceptible to extinction. Classical conditioning is as well. With classical conditioning, remember we said that the conditioned stimulus becomes conditioned because it's been paired with the unconditioned stimulus over time. But what happens if enough time passes where the conditioned stimulus is no longer paired with the unconditioned stimulus. In other words, what happens if Pavlov rings his bell over and over and over again without giving the food? Eventually the dogs are going to say, hey, this, this bell doesn't mean anything anymore. No food comes when they ring the bell. And the dog will stop drooling when the bell rings. Okay, so you can undo this. All right? Okay, so why did I go through all of that with you guys? Well, all of that is important because it's an important part of psychotherapy. Now, during the last set of slides that we're going to cover this semester, I'm going to go through and talk in more detail about different types of therapy and different types of assessment, so we'll get there a little bit later. But during this lecture, I also want to talk to you guys about behavior therapy. So behavior therapy has been extensively researched and is found to be effective in treating just about everything. Now there are some individuals that respond better to other kinds of treatments, but many individuals respond very well to behavior therapy using these behavior modification techniques. So just to give you a couple of examples here, um, we can treat phobias this way. We can treat phobias very well with behavioral um, therapy. The idea with a phobia is that perhaps we've learned an association right, between maybe you were attacked by a dog. And now it would make sense. Being attacked by a dog is an unconditioned stimulus that causes an unconditioned response of being afraid, right? That's natural. Nobody had to teach you to be afraid when something is biting you. However, what happens is that sometimes then we associate that with all dogs. 
And so now we have a conditioned stimulus, a conditioned fear here of dogs. So then, how do, what did we just say about extinction? We just said that extinction happens when the conditioned stimulus is presented without the unconditioned stimulus. So how am I going to cure someone of their fear of dogs? Well, this may sound unpleasant to the individual, but you put them in a room with a dog, and you try to choose a dog that you're sure will not bite them, but you put them in a room with a dog and force them, I mean, they have to consent, but you know what I mean, to stay in the room with the dog, and then they can leave if they want to, but the best thing for them to do is to stay in the room with the dog until their body calms down, and until they learn that that association is no longer valid, that they're not going to get bitten by every dog they see. Very brief there. So obviously we can treat phobias, but we can treat PTSD with behavior therapy. We can treat depression with behavior therapy. Pretty much all kinds of anxiety disorders. Um, substance is, we can see how someone who has a sleep problem, how we can reinforce good sleep hygiene, punish bad sleep hygiene, um, eating habits. There are just any number of things that we could treat with behavior therapy. Behavioral therapy is very much focused on the here and now, less so on the past. We want to try to build a better future, but we're going to try to stay where we are right now. We're going to try to find behaviors that are good, that are functional, that are adaptive, and reinforce those. We want to identify behaviors that are causing us problems and punish those, or at the very least, stop reinforcing those, and help an individual then to, to be happier with their life. A little bit more detail on that later, but kind of wrapping up today's lecture. So when we're talking about behaviorism in general, Skinner's theory in particular, very high on generating research, guiding action here, um, you'll, you'll be hard pressed to find anything more practical than behavior therapy. Um, so as far as guiding like a, a practitioner when they're working with a client, it's very much helpful for that. Um, internal consistency is very high. Um, falsifiability is very high. When there's been very few things we've said this semester were, were high on falsifiability, but if conditioning doesn't work, then we'll see that. Since everything that we're focused on is observable, we'll know whether our treatments work or not. Um, moderate on organizing knowledge. And it's difficult to rate it on parsimony. It's kind of hard to say if this is as simple as it can be. To me, it seems relatively parsimonious here. All right, concept of humanity, um, determinism over free will to the extreme. Depending on who you talk to on the behavioral side of things, they would say that potentially there's no such thing as free will. The idea that everything that we do is determined by our environment. So then your parents and your peers and society and the media, they're all reinforcing and punishing you. However... Having said that, we know that's true. Instinctively, we know that that's true, that we are reinforced and punished by our environment. But we do have some control over our environment, yes? I mean, we can control maybe, at least when you're an adult, you can control who you spend time around and that kind of thing. But optimism over pessimism, you can put yourself in an environment that works well for you, and then the reinforcement and the punishment from your society and from your environment might be a good thing for you. Um, kind of hard to have a debate over unconscious versus conscious here. Kind of hard to really talk about uniqueness versus similarity. Definitely social influence over biology, though. It's definitely more about the people that are around you. All right, so our activity for this week. It says, choose a behavior that you would like to change in yourself. Now, I put a few here just as examples of things that come to mind when I think about college students having behaviors they might want to change, but there's any number of things that you could choose. And what I want you to do is use the information from today's lecture to design your own behavior modification plan. Maybe you say, I need to sleep more, or I need to eat healthier foods, or maybe I need to stop procrastinating, or maybe I need to start exercising. I mean, there's any number of things you could say here. So for this week's activity, I want you to practice Skinner's techniques on yourself. Well, at least tell me how you would do it if you decided to. I'm not going to force you guys to start sleeping more, although I think you should get plenty of sleep. All right, so choose a behavior you want to change, and then think about how you could use positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment to change the behavior. Be sure to give an example for all four types. And then if you want to add something else in there, if you want to talk about shaping, you can. If you want to talk about extinction, you can. What I'm really looking for in this activity was to make sure that you understand the concepts of positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment. 
So when we're thinking about sleep, for example, like you could reinforce yourself in some way and give me details, but you could reinforce yourself for getting more sleep or you could punish yourself for not getting enough sleep or for not going to bed on time, that kind of thing. So let me know if you have any questions. This is our activity for this week. Um, I am also, as soon as possible, going to set up the um, Smarter Proctoring so that you can sign up for a time slot to take a proctored exam for exam four. So I'll be sending out an email with more information on that as soon as I have it. So don't forget that you have an activity and just let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, you guys have a great day.